Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV, powered by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to harringtonstar.com where you'll be able to see some of the greatest jobs in financial technology recruitment across the world. You'll also be able to find a host of insight to help you grow your brand, your team, your network and your career. You can see the latest financial technology salary survey. You'll be able to download the issue of the financial technologist focusing on the appetite for disruption. And our latest top 1% workplace awards will be out at the end of this year. If you work for a company that's a great place to work in financial technology, we want to hear from you. Enjoy the show, and I'll see you soon. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am absolutely delighted to uh, introduce you to a company that I've been really interested in reading about over the last couple of days. It's Crossover Markets. And uh, Brandon and Anthony, how are you both? Doing well. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, us. thank you for having us. Absolute pleasure. Listen, great to see you. We, we, we're crossing the uh, Atlantic here with, uh, with one of you in, uh, in uh, America, one of you over here in the UK. Um, lots of change, lots of opportunities over here at the moment. Sounds like an exciting journey to get into. We're going to get into all of that. We're going to find out all about what you're doing. And I think it's very exciting, very pioneering where you're at at the moment. So I'm looking forward to explaining all that to everyone who's watching at the moment. But before we get into all the meat of it, let's kick off at the start. Um, Brandon and Nancy, introduce yourselves. Sure. So I'm Brandon Mulvihill, uh, co-founder and CEO of Crossover Markets. And just to get a little bit of background uh, for myself, Anthony and I have similar backgrounds, uh, both in foreign exchange for over 18 years. So we are TradFi folks. Uh, I started a, a retail broker called FXCM, which was an institution that provided FX and CFD trading predominantly to retail clients to start. And then in time, we launched an institutional business that we called FXCM Pro. I ran that business globally. Uh, we had a wholesale boat business, which did over a trillion uh, a year in volume, and that was predominantly FX and index CFD contracts. We had a market data business. We had a prime of prime business. We had an ECN business. And Anthony and I worked very closely uh, for, on two different stints at FXCM Pro, running those various business lines. Roughly six years ago, Anthony and I both left and went to Jefferies to really re-kickstart an FX prime brokerage business. At the time, Jefferies was clearing something like 20,000 trades a year or something in that neighborhood. And by the time we left, we were clearing 200 to 300,000 trades per day. Wow. And so of the various things that we've done through our career, I would highlight that we have extensive knowledge base in retail flows, uh, extensive knowledge base with market makers and systematic hedge funds. And that's, uh, those are some of the client types that led us to that level of growth. And I think that'll give some good background to some of the things we'll touch on in this call. But I'll pause there and let Anthony talk about where we've diverged in our career. Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Anthony Mazaris. I am also co-founder and chief commercial officer of Crossover Markets. Um, Brandon and I started our careers really at the same time uh, back in 2004-ish. Um, working for FXCM. So out of college, I started working at FXCM on the institutional side in sales. Um, so worked at FXCM really within a number of different facets of the business, always front office, but always sort of sales and trading side. Um, in 2010, I left FXCM and Brandon and uh, uh, joined Citibank, where we launched an FX trading business called CityFX Pro and later on CityFX TradeStream. And both of those businesses were designed for mid-market and high net worth institutional clients trading on margin. So rather than trading on credit, these were these are margin trading clients, uh, most of which were sort of high frequency to mid-frequency, trading over an API or trading over, always trading electronically over one of the systems that we offered. Um, so really incubated that business and built it up from really a startup within the bank to uh, probably a top five um, liquidity provider in the space to the client segment. So built that business from 2010 to 2015. And then as, as fate would have it, we Citibank sold the business to FXCM. Uh, so I actually helped transition the business uh, from Citi to FXCM where I joined, where I actually 
went with the clients and the business and the tech to FXCM and actually joined back together with Brandon where we started working together again on the same desk. Uh, so that was that was fun. Uh, so worked on the institutional business, FXCM Pro, uh, after the city transition. And then Brandon and I left FXCM together and joined Jeffries where I ran sales globally for FX Prime Brokerage. So as Brandon mentioned, most of those clients there were, were retail brokers or sort of high frequency systematic shops. So um, I think we we're really proud of the, the job that we did at Jefferies because it was a, a really small unknown business. And we built that business into uh, definitely a top 10 FX prime broker on the street. So really excited, really proud of what we did there. And then uh, last year we, we left Jefferies and founded Crossover Markets and I now live in London. So I moved. From, <laughs> what a year. Uh, what a year. Yeah. So uh, I moved from New York to London about two months ago. So we have a team here in London. Um, London, for all intents and purposes, are, is our headquarters uh, and really is the, the center for where the most of our headcount are and where most of the growth will be for us. So I leave the office here in London. And yeah, it's been a fun time to, to move to the city. Tell me a little bit about that that sort of decision for why London becomes the head, the headquarters for you because uh, yeah. yeah there's there's quite a lot of press about that recently um, in the space yep. you're in and and actually maybe maybe it's uh yeah worthwhile before you answer that question just to give you a little bit of background about crossover markets as well because it's a it's an interesting space you're in that I'm keen to understand the the, the sort of uh, the London centric move as well from from that too so yeah far away. Yeah, so started the company when we decided to launch Crossover Markets. Uh, and, and just a, a quick background on the business. So Crossover Markets is uh, an institutional-only digital asset technology firm. Um, we've uh, we, we, we've built our technology for for really to be future-proof uh, within the institutional market really for super low latency and high throughput trading of, of digital assets and ultimately multi-asset trading. Um, when we when we started the company, we had felt that the opportunity within digital assets was abroad, really outside the US. So we made the decision to really focus on the international market. So it made total sense to move to London because really our entire client base is outside the US, mostly European as of right now, uh, many of which are here in the UK, uh, and even just the the staff that we've that we've been able to bring on to the company have all seemed to be London based, and that's where we really see the the future of our headcount growth as well. Fantastic, and and uh, you yeah, looking at, looking at that business, and and you you mentioned a year from having been in very sort of institutional <laughs> backgrounds. I mean, Brandon, you were talking there about the sort of tradfi uh, origins of of everything in your career. It's a big change, right? So tell us about the, the, the you know the whole the whole journey of uh, of, of starting up a, a, as a training venue and, and sort of learns that you must have had over that time. I think for Anthony and I specifically, the, the the biggest change is probably more the difference between working for a large institution and, and becoming an entrepreneur. And mm. that, I'd say that's probably been a bigger transition than moving from TradFi into crypto specifically. Yeah. Um, you know, going through a, a proper fundraise, building a cap table, building a board, you know, looking at corporate governance. Um, there's just so many things that institutions do uh, for employees and for managers that maybe we all take for granted, you know, when you work for a large, you know, some of them we don't like because it might be bureaucratic, but there, there's a lot that happens when you work for a large institution that's being done by multiple employees or different groups of people. And when you start your own company, you know, you're looking around the room and you're wearing a lot of hats. So hmm. I, I think for us, that was probably the biggest change. Um, to answer the second part of the question, I think that, you know, we just had this fundamental belief that when we looked at it, maybe to take a step back and kind of look at Anthony, uh, Anthony's career and my career, when he was at City operating a, this business called TradeStream, and when he was also at FXCM Pro and I was at FXCM Pro, what we were effectively offering was a, what I would call a wholesale business or an institutional brokerage offering. And so what that means is you're, you're curating liquidity and then you're onboarding clients and you're facing those, those clients as a counterparty, as a credit counterparty. And when we looked at the digital space, what we saw is there's effectively, the, there, there's effectively one operating model 
and there's retail brokers that call themselves exchanges and there's institutional brokers who call themselves exchanges, but they're both fundamentally doing the same thing. And so what we thought would be disruptive is we thought one, it would be absolutely necessary when we heard people say, how is institutional volume gonna grow and scale in a big way in crypto? Everyone goes to regulation as they should. We certainly need more clarity there. But the second thing that needs to happen is there needs to be a very clear separation between clearing and custody and execution. Mm. And, uh, and, and when that happens for a whole lot of reasons, we think volumes will explode and we think fees will compress. And the piece that we thought we could bring to the table was this execution layer where we could operate 24 seven, 365, but do so with equities and foreign exchange order logic and, and really bring something to the market that quite frankly does not exist. So there are certainly nuance when we got into crypto, uh, the custodial piece is, is probably the primary piece that comes to mind that really you have to unpack. It's truly different than what you would find in TradFi. But when you start to get away from custody and you look at what's happening today at execution, um, the central limit order book model, when you get to look at the onboarding of customers, be it retail or institutional, and what's happening or needs to happen there, uh, when you look at the market making practices, uh, you really are seeing very strong parallels between crypto and, uh, uh, and the TradFi world. So mm -hmm. I think for us, the, the learning curve in crypto was... There's certainly a barrier, there's nuance there, uh, but I, I would say that the, the biggest barrier is just being an entrepreneur and all the things that come with it. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I'm glad you said it as well, because I think people sort of come into it with these sort of rose tinted glasses of, of, of what can happen and actually seeing that there's a, I, I always talk about my very first job when I started the company and I'd come out of two listed businesses when we, when we first launched 13 years ago. The first thing I ever did was uh, clear out a fridge that stank of old milk. Um, and uh, I thought now, now, now I've really, now I've really made it. But the other side of that, and I think what you're, what you're, you're talking about with regards to you know the space that you're in, particularly coming through from that tradfi market, is is this this um, I guess exodus from the traditional markets into decentralized finance. There's a really um, strong population from you know from one to the other because of that sort of ability to say right, let's take all of the things that came out of that those institutions and all that sort of good learning and lessons and regulation, as we said before, that works out and to allow us to, to sort of transform, trans something, transform trans something that I think has got just tremendous opportunity to be better. And, and I think that, you know, with, with CrossX, um, you know, now live, et cetera, uh, and that's that's going out there. And, and as you say, look, it's, it's still a, a relatively early phase of the journey for, for you as a, as a company. That's uh, early feedback is important. Tell us how that's been. Okay, so um, I think the overall feedback so far has been overwhelmingly positive. I, it's interesting to speak with customers and understand what their expectations were coming into it. And it, the uh, I think customers have been pretty delighted to find out that, that what we're doing is definitely different. In a, in, a, in a central limit order book, all to all model, there's very little customization available, right? So if you are a market maker, putting a price into a central limit order book, you're exposing that price to the entire population of customers trading on that venue. It could be a retail client trading alongside an HFT, trading alongside a hedge fund, but you're putting one price into the ecosystem and you're sort of exposing it to the, to the entire world, right? So market makers are forced to price to the worst common denom denominator sometimes to protect themselves. So, it's been interesting to see and, and working with the market makers specifically around customizing pricing based off of different types of trading flow. So if it is a retail broker who has underlying retail customers who trade on an app or just on the, on the trading interface, then a market maker may be more willing to show a much tighter price to that client than they would um, a systematic hedge fund who trades over an API who cross connects to our servers and is you know able to trade very very quickly and in many times may be unprofitable for the market maker so those two types of clients because the the nature of the flow is very different those two types of clients should get different pricing it isn't always the same price for everyone so market makers 
have been really excited to work with us on configuring different streams of liquidity for different types of flow. And what that means, what we're finding is that it, this is a benefit to the, the takers of liquidity, right? Because if you're that retail broker, you now have access to pricing that is tighter and, and lower cost uh, and tailored really for their flow. So they're getting better terms than they would in this just general population of, of users. Um, so the trading costs come down. So ultimately that's what we're looking to achieve, right? We want the market makers to make money and we want trading costs to come down for the takers of liquidity. Uh, and we believe that this customization segmentation of flow definitely achieves that. And to have that validated by early adopters is it? You know, must yeah. be must, must be music to your ears. Just you're, you're sort of starting out and launching that. Yeah, it, exactly. And I think even just the level of communication that we've had with our customers is is pretty foreign in the space, unfortunately, um, because some of these changes have so many customers, and uh, th there really isn't much customization. There isn't always a ton of dialogue that happens between the market makers and the exchanges or the takers and the exchanges because there's really nothing that can be changed. Whereas with us, everything can be customized. So yeah. uh, I think it's refreshing for participants to be able to pick up the phone and talk to us. And we're listening on, on what they're actually looking to achieve by trading on our venue. And we're actually able to implement it. So uh, I think even just the level of communication has been refreshing for our users. I was thinking actually beforehand about you know, some of the things that I've seen over the over the you know the last few years of doing this show of, of, of the sort of golden threads I talk about the golden threads of companies that are successful within it and you mentioned there about actually listening to the users and taking that sort of feedback and do it which I think is obviously a, a, a key sign but also you know sort of solving problems and speed these are all things which I look at and I know you know the the, the uh, velocity of what you can do is 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 impressive the speed that you can add to it but also just looking at the the issues within within the space and issues within the marketplace and moving in it. And you've had, you know, from startup, you probably had one of the most volatile sort of periods within the digital asset space that you could possibly ever have, have, have imagined. So I love the fact that it's there and, and you're moving and agile with, with all of that sort of thing. But, and when I go back to the issues and the things you're seeing, we've seen this sort of digital, um, digital asset market structure be something you, you alluded to it beforehand, where there's a lot of, uh, of um, flux in that. We're sitting, you know, it, it's, it's there for a reset and the thing you guys have spoken about beforehand. Tell us why that is. Yeah, so the, the market reset concept, it, it kind of, this is doubling up on some of the things we talked about um, just moments ago, which is um, maybe it's best to look at it from a maker's perspective. So imagine you're a, a TradFi maker, a very serious shop who's pricing multi-asset classes and so on and so forth. Um, when you come to crypto, one of the things that, that you learn very quickly is if you want to trade with 300 counterparties, you have to settle with 300 counterparties bilaterally. And this is operationally inefficient. It's expensive. So it, uh, there's lots of friction to it. The increase of uh, operational uh, uh, air rates and things like this. The, and, it's, and it's very foreign to the maker, which is something that I think was a word that Anthony used previously. So the maker in foreign exchange would be accustomed to maybe pricing 300 counterparties, but net settling all the activity with one. And this has been our fundamental belief is that if a market maker can do the same thing in crypto, they can trade with 300 counterparties, but net settle with one. Because remember, a market maker very often is buying Bitcoin over here and selling Bitcoin over here. So their market flat. And from a financing standpoint, they want the ability to, to be flat and not have to skew or come out of it. Right. And, and so this creates uh, what, what crypto has done inadvertently is created kind of a synthetic disease when it comes to pricing. Right. So it, it has a problem with the stability of pricing at times because of this issue. Uh, but it also has a problem when we talk about the ability to scale. And it's why if you look at the volumes, the average daily volumes of crypto, they're pretty in a relatively tight range and the range is almost entirely correlated to volatility. And we mm. think there's a huge opportunity for average daily volumes to explode when fungibility, which is what we're talking about, is brought to the market. So the reason for this, the reason this has happened is that crypto is uh, one of the only financial markets where the, the market itself was created in retail first, 
right? And not normally it's an institutional space and then retail yeah, yeah. Adopts it and yeah, absolutely. started in reverse. And so if you are an institution over the last eight years and you wanted to participate, your only choice was to participate with an institutional or retail broker. That's the only yeah. way you could. And what we're seeing in the, in the past maybe four to six months is massive updates on the prime brokerage and the clearing front. So you're seeing Hidden Road Partners, who certainly I think at the forefront of driving fungibility has come out with a whole series uh, of announcements, I think including some regulatory things like their FCA licensing um, and different partnerships that are exciting. You look at uh, Cebo Digital is mm -hmm. in the US and, and starting to talk more regularly about their clearing. Uh, there's, a, there's another company in the US, EDX Markets just implied that maybe clearing is coming. Numerous Clear Token, is a product that's not here today, but it's that's a product that's being discussed. And so this is really attracting the type of uh, market participants and style of flows and behavior that, that we champion because it, it promotes operational efficiency, uh, mm. drives volume and ultimately lowers cost. So for us, I mentioned before, we care about the execution layer. And where we think we can be very disruptive is helping to drive down the cost of trading. And so there's like three ways you drive down the cost of trading. One is through fungibility, which is through the prime brokerage piece. Uh, number two is through the customization things that Anthony talked about. So if you're a market maker and you can provide a custom price for every user we have on the platform, yeah. then you can be more aggressive for the style of flows that you like. And then third is speed. Mm. So when you think of speed, normally the, the feedback Anthony and I get when we start talking about speed and, you know, five to 20 microseconds, people kind of roll their eyes. And like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But what they're not capturing is we, we agree that directly maybe the market isn't quite ready to take advantage of five microseconds. What the market isn't grasping, though, is your spread and your cost of trading is correlated to speed. Right. If, if you can come to our platform and get 20 to 50 price updates in the time it takes you to get one price update with a competitor, who are you going to be able to, to be mm. more aggressive with? Right. We've used this analogy a million times. If you're sitting there on your computer buying an airline ticket and, you know, it, your price refreshes every minute and your neighbor price updates every 15 minutes, who's going to get a better price? Of course, yeah. speed does matter when it comes to costs. Yeah. And so uh, I think for us, this is where the timing is now appropriate, um, where what we thought would come to fruition is coming to fruition. And the final piece I would add to it is just, uh, we thought this was going to happen naturally anyway. This was a story that Anthony and I and, and Vlad, our third co-founder, we were talking about a year ago with certain investors. Um, but what's kind of escalated it is the fact that you know, the events of FTX forced every, all the institutions to reconsider uh, credit counterparty risk, yeah. uh, SEC fines, and just regulatory pressure is causing everyone to rethink who are the counterparties that they're facing. Um, and the result has been people of most institutions have reduced the number of counterparties uh, that they faced. Um, and so, and then the banking crisis we saw with, with that included the future in Silvergate just expanded this. And so what we're seeing is our thesis of what we thought would happen naturally is happening, but it's happening now at a much faster uh, clip. And so from our view, vantage point, the market is going through a pretty significant reset where the institutional market is saying, no, 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 we're going to trade in this market. We are going to participate in a big way, but we're going to do it in a market structure that makes more sense to us than kind of the brokerage model. So I'm very interested in, in that, in that, because, you know, as, as we sort of, you know, joked about earlier on, the timing wise of your, your sort of foray into this as entrepreneurs into uh, the digital asset space, you know, would have been interesting to some, to some extent, because it could have been, can, you know, in some ways have been at a worse time, but actually from what you're saying there, I guess it's almost like the perfect time to be, you know, yeah. to be launching and moving into that space, right? That's yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it, so we would not have been able to launch our business if, the concept of prime brokerage in crypto didn't exist. Yeah. And so in order to gain access to our platform CrossX, you have to have a credit sponsor. So you have to have a prime broker. So in just by way of example, a client would have a 
prime brokerage account at say Hidden Road, uh, Hidden Road would onboard them. They provide this customer credit to deal on our platform. And they're essentially sponsoring a client to trade on our system and match against another participant within our ecosystem anonymously. Um, two clients match, we report that trade to Hidden Road or Prime Broker, and then the Prime Broker does post-trade settlement. So we don't face clients from a credit perspective. We don't have counterparty risk. We're not principal. Um, the client has a has a, a, a prime brokerage relationship, and we're just matching trades anonymously. So the, this concept of separation between execution and custody or, or prime brokerage, it, 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 a requirement was that there needs to be prime brokers to, to be able to support this. So it's a, it's a smart point you brought up because a year ago, Hidden Road were around and they were, they were certainly offering prime brokerage, but it was still relatively immature. Mm -hmm. So the, the maturity of clearing in the space has certainly been accelerated by some of the market events over the last year. And um, we think it's skewing obviously more towards traditional market structure. And that's, and we champion that because that's where we think we play well in, in yeah. the ecosystem. I absolutely agree. I think everything that I've been reading, hearing, talking to people about very much points to that sort of thing. And it's this sort of interesting sort of state of flux where we've got sort of um, different you know, venues in, in digital assets. And, and that sort of evolves to become you know, more and more significant. Um, you know, I, think, I think as, we, as, as you guys said pre off camera, you know, now more than ever. Talk to us what you mean by that and why, why it matters to how we refer to different venues at the moment. Yeah, th th this is a big point for me right now, which is the the idea is that we, we call all of these brokers exchanges, and and that's fine, and, and you know, but but in spirit, there's a, it's very problematic uh, on multiple fronts, and, and I give you one extreme example when FTX was having its challenges, at least for the first two days in the U.S. Uh, from the news I was watching there were literally headlines of will Bitcoin survive, which to me showed me the market's not really understanding the relationship mm. of who is doing what. For example, uh, if a, if a US based stockbroker just overnight became insolvent for any number of reasons, we wouldn't be <laughs> talking about the survivability of Apple. Um, yeah. They're just not related, right? It, what it means is another exchange or broker is gonna come in and pick up market share. Yeah, uh, I think more specifically, the, the reason that it matters is that one is on the regulatory front. Right now, when you look at a lot of the quote unquote exchange licenses, they address things like capital adequacy and uh, marketing disclosures, uh, the rules of staking, um, you know, the, the separation of the different business models that an exchange might run. And really what they're doing is they're addressing things that a broker would be familiar with, right? If you're a licensed broker in the US or in the UK or what have you, th these are the things you're thinking about, right? These are the things that if you're regulated, you already do, right? The separation of client money and operating cash. These are not things that an execution venue or a quote unquote actual exchange would go get a license for, mm. right? It, it, typically a trading venue is, is really concerned about simply the order execution, the rule book, making sure participants understand the rules of engagement of how to trade, um, the protection of things around that, like uh, penetration testing and cybersecurity and so on and so forth. But we're not, for example, at Crossover, we don't hold client assets, right? We're not involved yeah. in the exchange of assets. We're not counterparty to any trades. So the exchange license doesn't necessarily make light, sense to us because it's not an actual exchange license. We would argue it's a brokerage license, right? So um, I, I think that these semantics have real life implications. And, and I also think uh, if we start thinking of exchanges as brokers, it really starts to better demonstrate why we think the market is going where it is. I, I just think it, you know, and I'll give you one more example. You know, when you look at where a bank trades foreign exchange contracts day in and day out, they don't do it through a retail broker. Yeah. Right. They're trading in the interbank market uh, with the other banks, with other some non-bank makers through ECNs and various trading venues. They're not traditionally trading with a retail broker unless they're a market maker to that broker. 
Similar, uh, similarly, if you look at like equity flows, you know, Morgan Stanley, it isn't opening an account with an American retail stockbroker to trade equities, right? They're trading in, in, in this concept is so foreign and so obvious to us. And in crypto, it doesn't quite smack us in the face because we call these companies exchanges rather than brokers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's one example of uh, uh, semantics, but uh, I've got more, but I'll, we'll, we'll keep it there. <laughs> it's hilariously put as well. When you, when, you, when you sort of put that at the start to say that the, the, uh, yeah, the, the, I guess the, everyone calling for the, the death of Bitcoin from that, 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 sort, that, sort of, uh, that sort of standpoint, when you put it the other way and <laughs> just talk, talk about it, it suddenly becomes so obvious, doesn't it? I've never actually had someone sort of uh, illustrate it in such a sort of clear, clear manner with that. I think one of the other areas that's really interesting about the, this, the sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, going back to that sort of uh, you know, convergence of TradFi and DeFi markets is one of the things that's been a real lure uh, for people moving from, you know, the traditional space has been the, the, the vast sort of uh, opportunity and excitement about technology that sits behind everything within this. And it's been, a, you know, I've, I've spoken to many people over the last few years who, who are interested, obviously, in the asset class itself and, and crypto and such like. But the real lure just goes into the actual underlying technology that comes, you know, that comes behind it. And there's lots of different approaches to it. Um, there's lots of different ways of, of doing it. But I imagine every company that's going to sort of uh, be setting themselves up are very, uh, very much looked at the tech that's behind it. So talk to us about your, your sort of approach on technology and, and, uh, and how you're building it um, you know, for, for institutional users specifically. Sure. So I, I'll tell you that maybe I'll tee this one up and let Anthony drive it home. But I think that... <laughs> The, the thing, were, the piece that, and this started way back for Anthony and I, uh, this was two years ago when we were looking at the space. The, the fact that 24 7, 365 trading is just a minimum barrier to entry in crypto is really interesting, right? You, you get, you have to do that if you want to play the game, right? You, you get no extra credit. That's just minimum barrier. And, and when you think about it, in foreign exchange, the technology operates 24 by 5. And typically every day at the end of the day, the tech normally goes down for anywhere five minutes to 30 minutes is, is typical um, for a whole number of reasons. And then it's closed on the weekends. And that's where a lot of updates and enhancements happen. In equities, it's the same concept, only it's you know, kind of eight to five type of environment. And it's down every single day. Uh, and when you look at, and you know, coming from the experience we have and our CTO, we should highlight was 25 plus years in equities operating and building various trading venues. And then he did 10 years at foreign exchange where he was uh, building and operating fast match, which sold to Euronext. Um, you know, he, he would be the first to tell you, and we can tell you from our experience, it's really difficult to take institutional dark pools or ECNs and adapt them 24 seven, 365. Yeah. So the first thing we would just say right off the bat is the idea to build that type of, a, 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 of technology that does not need to go down, that truly in time could be multi-asset, we, we thought would be really, really powerful. And so at a super yeah. high level, that's probably the first. I, I stole probably the easy one. But I'll let you <laughs> and so you've got to drive, drive that home now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so what I'd say on the technology is that it's it, it's obviously an exciting space, right? There's there's many different so so crypto is such a broad category in that there's so many different products within that sort of uh, hang off of uh, either either our core businesses within crypto or sort of services to crypto, right? We're we're on the trading side, so that's where we are. We're solely focused. So. Um, where we really felt that there was a gap in the market was was the performance of the technology of, of kind of the current ecosystem, and and that's not that's not speaking negatively to any of our peers or competitors or any of the the venues out there. It's more that a lot of the venues that um, at least on the institutional side that have um, that are servicing institutional clients, and, and this isn't just crypto. This is is really broad across the market, they're, they're not brand new, right? It's it's rare that you have a, an, a, an entirely new trading system built from scratch in, in the year 2022 or 2023, right? So we did have 
the luxury of, of building our technology from scratch in C++ using um, modern development techniques, using the latest hardware, um, and having a team that has decades of experience doing this exact thing, right? So we, we built our technology really to be the fastest and highest throughput system in the market. So I think Brandon mentioned before, we're executing trades sort of sub 20 micros. Um, that's what we advertise. In reality, we're probably faster than that. Um, we, have the, we have the ability to process millions of trades per second. Um, so that comes especially in handy when we are targeting and supporting retail brokers who have, in some cases, millions of underlying retail clients. So when a meme coin gets hot and something goes on Twitter, everyone does the exact same thing at the exact same time and trades. And so the infrastructure needs to be able to handle these extreme bursts of messages really within, within the same second. So we built a system to be able to support that. Um, and you know, it, 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 market makers like it and takers of liquidity like it because market makers have the ability to print quotes to us in single digit micros. They have the ability to cancel or change their quotes in just as fast. So there's less risk of a, of a stale quote sitting on an exchange because the, the, the exchange didn't have the time to, wasn't fast enough to, to replace that quote. And the market data that takers get from our pricing is, is very rich, right? We're able to print many, many, many quotes inside of any single quote on another venue. So they're getting lots of information in between every single tick um, on some of the other exchanges in the market which leads to better price discovery and better accuracy for their for their system. So we've been just solely focused on being the, the highest performance and fastest tech in the market. And yeah, maybe it's it's a little bit of overkill right now. The speed is, it, it's obviously very fast and maybe um, some of the clients aren't able to take advantage of it just yet, but we think the market is maturing very quickly and we, we've built yeah. a system for the future. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're very happy with what we've accomplished so far. It's, it sort of reminds me, and excuse me if it's ignorant, but it goes back to, to sort of 10 years ago in electronic trading when there was the race to zero latency and uh, yeah, FPGA and everything sort of being pushed into that, so that sort of area to, to look at it. I think Brandon, you mentioned before about the sort of uh, you know, cost reduction through speed, but I think also it's about as much about the, the efficiency of cost reduction and, and removal of that. It's also about the, the enhanced productivity that can come through from that. And, and uh, I've said a number of times recently where, where there's so much pressure on companies with, with narrowing margins to increase the, you know, the, the one thing that you can do is increase the productivity to, you know, to, to increase the margins from that. And I think this is to me where speed comes into it with, with, with tech. And uh, yeah, as you say, if it's ahead of the game, I think that game only very, you know, catches up with that very, very quickly. And I think the acceleration of everything at the moment means that that's, uh, thing that's, that's coming into play. Oh, I had one thing to that, Toby. Uh, to think about. So think about a, a retail consumer in almost any asset class, right? So if you want to trade equities, you open it with a broker, you deposit collateral, and then you can buy some, some stocks, right? Um, if you want to, same thing for an exchange. So I want to, I, I'm sitting in London, let's say I want to open an account with IG, right? And I open the account, I collateralize it, I can buy some foreign exchange or CFD contracts. And the same is true of crypto. And this is, you know, I call this a brokerage model, but it's uh, another way to think of it is it's, it's what we call closed loop. It's a captive model. So by definite, if Toby, if you open an account with your whatever, uh, I use Coinbase, for example, um, if you open an account with Coinbase and you buy Bitcoin, by definition of doing one trade with Coinbase, you're actually, they are guaranteed to get two trades out of you. Because when you mm -hmm. go to close, you're not going to close it somewhere else. You're going to close it on Coinbase, right? So this is captive. And in the, in, the, in the retail world, this is completely, this is the operating model. This is how it works. Again, Anthony and I going back 20 years ago, this is where we cut our teeth was as in the retail brokerage model. But in institutional trading, you know, a different way to think about it is in retail trading, if Toby, if I get you as a client, I'm expecting 100% of your business. Yeah. Right. You're either my client or, or someone else's. There's no in between. But institutions don't behave that way, right? Like um, if you look at a market maker, whoever you want to pick, Citadel or Virtu, or you know, you go right down the list. When these people trade foreign exchange, they trade over 10 venues. 
mm-hmm. right? When they trade equities, they're trading over countless uh, uh, counterparties. And everyone's competing for 2%, 7% market share because it's just not realistic that you're going to get an institution to do all of their business over you. That's not how institutions behave. And the point you were just making about efficiency, that's part of the efficiency uh, loop. And the only way to participate in that growth, could maybe be a, a leader in uh, making that growth happen, but also participating as the growth happens, is to really put kind of your, your draw your line in the sand to say, I'm either a clear, I'm a custodian, I'm a market maker, I'm a venue, be who you need to be, but trying to be all of those things, yeah. our experience just flat out will not work in the institutional space. At least yeah. me. And I think that's where a big part of where this convergence is so necessary, right? Because I think the last, you know, the last few years have absolutely borne that out and proved proved exactly why that needs to be the case. And I guess that sort of leads into the whole regulatory bit. If you, you know, if you're looking at at, at the sort of uh, you know, the main drawer of of, of tradfi into DeFi can be about the sort of technology and and the you know, the opportunity that it comes in. If you're looking at DeFi's um, desire to bring in tradfi, it's about regulation and um, you know, I've spoken a lot recently about you know restoring trust in the space. I've spoken a lot about um, you know ha- how that sort of happens now. It moves further forward, and a lot of it is down to to you know to, in, in my mind the whole sort of uh, you know trust is, is built through communication, and communication is built through clarity. Um, and and uh, I know that's something that you guys think think a lot about as well, right? Yeah, I mean, we we don't. You know, I would uh, say. That- for, and this is just my opinion specifically, but on the just to take a tap into the DeFi space real quick, I, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic long term, and I think there's equally a lot of reason to be very pessimistic in the short to medium term. Uh, the, the, the DeFi piece not being examined is everyone I think is overly focused on the technology related to addressing concerns of compliance. Mm. So these questions of how do you know your customer? How do you AML? How do you do all these things appropriately? And when you go to different conferences, you'll see on stage, a lot of people have yeah. technical yeah. things. But I, I don't think the technical piece is the, uh, is the actual concern. When you look at what Western regulators are doing, right? And I say Western because I'm not just talking about the US, but the FCA and Often, right? And uh, ASIC in Australia and the JFSA. It's more than just the technology piece around AML and compliance. It, it's also getting their pound of flesh. So imagine some bad actor comes onto a DeFi protocol and starts trading. And you know they're doing some level of wash trading for nefarious purposes. Someone else is making money on these trades. Mm. And ultimately, when you look at what the regulator wants, it isn't just the ability to know and understand and capture that there's a problem. They want the ability to financially do harm, to go after someone who is on the other side of that activity and, 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 and invoke a fine or penalties, right? They, they want their pound of flesh. And this is a major piece not being discussed or, in my opinion, being resolved in the DeFi space. And it's a ma- it, it, to me, it's the one area where the two pieces are diverging, not converging. Mm. Uh, and so I think that that's a piece that needs to change. I think everything else, though, when you look at the space, is totally converging yeah. uh, in, in a massive way. And I just think five years from now, we're not, no one's going to be talking about TradFi and crypto. You, you're just doing crypto or you're not, right? We're yeah. not going to. Um, and, uh, and we already should know this to some degree. When you look at CNBC or Bloomberg and you watch the ticker, you'll see Apple and Euro dollar, and you'll see Bitcoin, and, and no one's making on the ticker some distinction. You're just looking mm-hmm. at different assets and the prices. And so I think a lot of this jargon is in time going to go uh, the way of the dinosaur. Uh, and so we, we definitely agree that there'll be that, that this convergence is happening now. And, and this is what we can call it DeFi. This is all just finance. Yeah. In yeah. finance, uh, how you can be in finance tomorrow, and we can do crypto together or foreign. We can do whatever you want. They're they're not really separate things. It's the establishment of a of a genuinely new asset class in right. into the into the traditional, isn't it? And that's that's yeah, as you say, look, traditional only it was what was once disruptive. That's the, <laughs> the very nature of it all, isn't it? And uh, that's that's where we're heading. So. 
Um, it's a fascinating thing, and I'm really excited to to you know, to watch your journey and see where you're going. And as as we as we release this, it'll be sort of pushing towards the uh, you know the final quarter of the year and, and and such like. That's an exciting sort of place for you guys to you know, to be. I'm sure that uh, yeah, I think someone someone explained sort of months as dog years at the moment in the uh, in the space that you guys sit in. But you know, the, the, a lot can uh, pass between when we film this and when it when it comes out. But if we're looking at that and seeing where where you guys are heading. Uh, where you know crossover are, are going to focus your energies for the rest of the year, uh, and what twenty twenty four looks like for you know for, for you you and the team. Tell us a little bit about that. Wet, wet our appetite, excite us, give us the grand finale. Sure, we uh, I think we've got uh, two, if not three, major partnerships to announce that will hold fire until the fall. Um, but really excited about these announcements that are coming out. Um, and uh, I think that's the first thing that we would lead with. I think secondly, I think we're going to surprise people on our trade count and, and trading volumes. Anthony's team is doing a great job. Uh, the, the demand uh, for the size of our team at times has been, has been challenging. Uh, we have no shortage of customers and onboarding that we're trying to quickly get to uh, level trading. Uh, so I think that's uh, a, a second thing. I think a third thing is just a whole thing, a whole topic around tech, various uh, uh, order logic behaviors, the way liquidity management happens, but then also some of the physical hardware, our expansion uh, geography, uh, geographically into different data centers um, to give clients uh, a better service in that regard. And then the last thing I think probably relates direct, directly to Anthony himself. Uh, Anthony moved his, you know, his wife and kids and, and the dog from New York to London, and uh, that wasn't a trivial thing. That was very thoughtful, and it, there's a whole variety of reasons he did that, but, but certainly atop that is when we think about talent and hiring and bringing people in-house, we are really thinking about uh, kind of the European theater broadly, but specifically London and uh, tapping into that market and build, continuing to build out the team there. There's some extraordinary talent over here, and and uh, yeah. you know, Anthony, you, you, you'd have probably have seen that that together. I think there's a really exciting sort of uh, environment for it, and we're yeah. seeing a government there that's very sort of committed to this space and trying to make it as easy as possible for people to do business. So, on a finish, t tell us about that move. So, so the, the wife and kids and dog have, have settled in. We know we know yeah. you're near a big park, so they must be loving that. The dog in particular chasing deer all around Richmond. But uh, how's 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 the move been for you? It's been great. Yeah, we, we've uh, luckily we, we moved about two months ago. It was right at the start of the summer. We had beautiful weather. Uh, I kind of joked with everyone. To didn't say, last you know, for long for you, did it? <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of joked with everyone to say, why does everyone complain about the weather so much in London? This is fantastic. Uh, but I, uh, it's, I think it's kind of gotten back to normal here now. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, been an, it's been an amazing move. Wife and kids are loving it. The dog absolutely loves it. Um, unfortunately, he he had a little hiccup uh, on the on the flight over. He was detained for a day, so he was uh, he was an outlaw for a day. But we were able to get him through <laughs> customs, and uh, happy to report that he is home and happy. But uh, yeah, the, the move has been great, and uh, I, I really echo what you say about the talent pool here in London. I we're we're actively hiring. We are actively looking for candidates in all roles, and I'm so impressed by the level of talent. Um, specifically here in London, with not only you know, prior experience for working in traditional firms and crypto native firms, but really the excitement for 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 the crypto market and and, and the industry, and and they sort of see our vision without seeing without too much pitching. Um, so, there's a lot yeah. of hunger for it, right? There's a lot of people who want to get into this space. I think there's people who've been in, you know. We'll go back to that word traditional, but they've been in those traditional environments yeah. and sort of felt a little bit stagnant from it. And it's yeah. just, you know, to, to have that sort of level of excitement and passion and, and vision of what it can be and where it can go, that was probably dampened, you know, for, you know, for a couple of months at the back end of yeah. last year. I, I think that that sort of hunger is very much back. And we, you know, our, our day job, as you, as you may know, is as, as a recruitment business in this, in this sector. And, uh, we're seeing we're seeing a real appetite for people, you know, every single day knocking at the door, so, you know, wanting to yeah. wanting to move into that sort of area. So it's an exciting time for every, everyone involved. Um, yeah. 
Gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm going to finish just by asking, uh, you know, there'll be lots of people who are watching this, both as, as people who want to you know, look and talk and join your business as, as much as people who want to find out more and, and engage with you, clients, customers, everything in between. Tell me, um, tell me what's the best way to get in touch with you and what should they be looking at? I, I think I think best way to get in touch. So our website is crossovermarkets.com. Um, we're all on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out to us individually on LinkedIn or just shoot us an email from, from our contact information on the website. Uh, we're always excited to have a conversation with either somebody who's interested in having a, getting a job with us or working with us or a new client who potentially has questions on, on what we can offer. So we, we welcome people reaching out to us and we are we're very, very, we're very receptive to, to uh, cold contact. Good man. Excellent stuff. Well, Brandon, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Really good to get to know you, hear a little bit more about the business. And uh, yeah, it, uh, I, I love that sort of journey that you're on at the moment, that sort of startup phase and seeing where it goes. And I can't wait mm -hmm. to see the uh, the continued rise and rise of the company. So really appreciate you both coming on today. Thank, thank you for having us, Toby. Appreciate it. Absolute thank pleasure. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.